another episode of the Speak Real podcast, sharing one-on-one conversations. We believe that storytelling is the best way to empower youth and give them the platform to find their voices. Presented by Youth Speak. Youth experience, youth voice, youth empowered. So hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Speak Real podcast. My name is Lolita, and I'm so excited to bring another episode with a very special guest, Stacey Smith, who is co-founder of COVID-19 Student Support Network, as well as chair of the Youth Advisory Council. So we're going to be speaking with Stacey about her journey, some of the things that she's gone through in terms of her mental health. We're also going to be sharing some of the organizations, the awesome organizations that she's been able to start during the pandemic, which is really, really amazing. So really excited to get into this conversation. So without further ado, we'll get right into this, this, this talk. So Stacy, let me ask you, it's very important to check in on your friends and family, but of course on yourself as well. So I'm gonna ask you, if you could choose a color to describe your mood right now, what color would that be and why? Ooh, fun question. Um, I would say I'm probably a mix between blue and red. It's been a very, you know, heavy week with, um, you know, a lot of things going on in the mental health uh, space and my own schooling. It's very busy. Um, so I'm probably right in the middle, like I'm doing okay, but I'm a little, uh, little tired out. So um, I'm excited to wind down and get some rest over the weekend. So probably, yeah, probably like a reddish blue color, I'd say. Yeah. Reddish blue. I like that. That's the first time that someone has mixed the two colors. So I love that you get, you gave two colors and I love that you gave that. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Awesome. Of course, yeah. Great. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Give us a little bit about your background, you know, maybe some mm-hmm. of the organizations that you're a part of. Tell us about yes. Yeah, sure. So I do a lot of different things. Um, so I'll start kind of my educational background. So I graduated last uh, year from Dalhousie University in Halifax with my Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology. Um, I'm currently attending the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton um, for my Bachelor of Education um, in elementary. Um, it's been a great experience so far. Um, amazing school, amazing program, very supportive uh, faculty, um, classmates and friends. It's been really great so far. Um, I'm originally from St. John, New Brunswick. Always make sure to mention that. So I was in Halifax the last eight years. Um, and kind of over the pandemic, I guess, I've been doing a lot more work um, in youth engagement, child and youth health, and obviously mental health. Um, I am the co-executive director of the Young Canadians Roundtable on Health, um, which is an organization that advocates for child and youth health and providing that youth voice behind that. Um, I've also done some work, um, real close work with uh, Frame, uh, the youth partner. So providing some of my feedback as someone that uh, has lived mental health experience. Um, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety back in 2017 and currently still have those, uh, those struggles now. Um, and I'm, you know, happy to share those, uh, those specific struggles with everyone that can relate, um, be able to provide, you know, a little bit of that lived expertise to people. Um, I do a lot of different things, a lot of different groups. Um, one other highlight I'd love to mention is my role um, with uh, the New Brunswick Child and Youth Advocates Office. Um, we just released our review into uh, mental health and youth suicide prevention services in the province on Wednesday. And I had the honor of being able to present a few of the recommendations at the press conference and release of the report. Um, I was a co-chair of the uh, Youth Advisory Council along with Sue Duguay. Um, which was an amazing experience, and I'm excited to continue that work um, into the rest of the year, um, hopefully with an actual youth advisory council, and just really ensuring that the government's going to put these recommendations into place. Lots of these reports have been done in the past, and nothing's really happened from them, so I'm looking forward to that. In my very limited spare time, <laughs> um, just a little bit about what I like to do. Um, I love, you know, going out, trying new foods. Um, I play hockey on the side as a goalie. Um, love going to sports events. Um, yeah, just really love getting out into nature. Um, just recently went canoeing for the first time. So kind of getting into more adventure type, uh, type yeah. events. So yeah, that's a little bit about me in the nutshell. <laughs> awesome. No, that is, yeah. wow. That is beautiful that you do so many different things. You wear so many different hats. I really, really love that. And also love that you also keep in touch with nature and um, doing things like hockey and connecting with yourself and trying things like canoeing just to keep your mental health kind of, you know, those are the kind of things that help our mental health for sure. So I love that you shared those things. And also it's very interesting that you shared about um, a little bit about your struggles with depression and anxiety. Can you talk to us a little bit more about um, some of the things that happened and some of the struggles that you, you faced with that? 
Yeah, so I've had some, you know, real struggles with that, like I guess, back in 2017. I'd actually say anxiety I've dealt with since I was a child. Um, it's a family inherited trait. A lot of my family's dealt with anxiety, in particular, depression a little bit as well. Um, I guess I'm just, you know, I grew up around a really, um, not a difficult environment per se, but just very, you know, high expectations of you need to do this now and do this now. So I just got a lot of anxiety from that. And that's kind of come into my, into adulthood, which is a tough situation to be in. And the depression is really based upon, you know, some unfortunate situations with um, others that have just, you know, made me feel, you know, a lot, made me feel bad about myself, unfortunately, and having a low sense of uh, self-worth and a low sense of, um, you know, that I'm, you know, that I'm not a great person, which is unfortunate because I know back in my mind, I do all these great things for people, but then there's these other people that decide to put me down a peg by me feeling like I'm not good enough. Um, so some of these, um, you know, relationships haven't been the best. And over the past several months, I've had these specific struggles and a lot of this stuff has been recurring. Um, but I guess since coming back to UNB and being, you know, immersed into my education and meeting some really great people, um, I've been able to share those things with those people and I've been able to really cope a lot better. Um, I'm by no means cured and I don't think really anyone's cured for mental health struggles, but uh, I feel like it's an everyday, it's an everyday prop and, you know, every day is a new day and, you know, it's just, you know, it's a, it's an ongoing process. Uh, thank you for opening up about that and like um as someone who deals with anxiety myself and um, I know how I know what a struggle it can be so it's really interesting for me that you talked about it being a family inherited trait that is really interesting yeah. because that's something that I didn't know yeah yeah it's I do know like my dad has struggled with anxiety since he was younger um a lot of it stemming from he was a on the police force back uh, here in New Brunswick so I know a lot of that probably has to do with some of that um and, you know, it's just an inherited thing. I think that's run through our, my dad's side of the family. So, and a little bit on my mom's side. Um, so I find it quite, quite interesting that the family, you know, being inherited from family is interesting because it's something that I have heard about. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of the biggest thing that stemmed from that. And obviously, you know, post-secondary education has not helped either, you know, stress yeah. about exams, anxious <laughs> about whether I'm going to graduate on time. You know, that was a big thing last year for COVID. Um, am I going to graduate on time? I've been, you know, at this degree for five years. So that was anxiety inducing. So there's obviously a lot of, you know, external triggers, but I feel like there is some internal, you know, inheriting from your family and all that. Yeah. And I also find that it's really interesting that you shared that those experiences that you had, um, you know, dealing with anxiety when you were young, you start to notice how those things start to come into your adulthood and affect, your, affect you in your adulthood. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience and what it's been like and how you came overcame that? Yeah, so I feel like, you know, I've kind of brought those traits that I've um, inherited, um, not so much from my family, but just from, you know, my childhood, you know, how I grew up being around, I was kind of the only girl in the neighborhood. So a lot of the guys gave me lots of trouble, of course. And, you know, there was lots of bullying and things like that. So I think that's like really a major cause of the reason that those things are brought into adulthood and it's affected, you know, personal relationships, whether they're friendships or um, romantic relationships. I know that those things have affected that. Um, and it's something I'm trying to work on and, you know, build on. Um, it's something that recently happened that affected, you know, a potential relationship for me. And it's something I'm still trying to, you know, be careful what I say here, because I don't know who's listening. <laughs> um, I'd say that I'm, I am trying to make that situation better but it's been difficult because, you know, mental health is still a stigmatized, stigmatized um, thing that some people still don't understand. So I think that's definitely something that uh, people need to understand more that there's a lot of mental health issues and, you know, traumatic experiences can affect people's mental health and affect the way they see things, you know, and it's affected the way that I interact with, you know, the opposite sex for myself. So yeah, no, I really, it, um, I think it's really important that you brought up, the, brought up those points and especially connecting it to that feeling of not being enough. You shared about that feeling. I feel like a lot of us kind of deal with that or you know, I know that for me personally, that's something that because of the things that I've kind of dealt with in my childhood, that was something that I took over into my adulthood as well. So I love that you shared that and you're opening up about that, that feeling of not being enough because it's something that not a lot of people can really admit 
right? It's kind of, it's difficult to admit. So I really, really appreciate that you opening up and sharing that. Part of it. Yeah. And I feel like my resiliency has improved a lot, you know, over the past several months, you know, with the things that have been going on in my life. So, you know, onward and upward. <laughs> exactly. Onward and onward. I love it. I love it. Very beautifully said. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for opening up and sharing your story with us. So that's been yeah. great. And like, I want to get more into some of those organizations that you're a part of. I want to talk a little bit more about COVID, the COVID-19 Student Support Network and exactly what that is and exactly what you're doing there. Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned last March, I was about to graduate from high school and things went online really quickly near the end of the term and things, um, you know, we're really up in the air. Like, am I going to graduate from university on time? Will this affect my graduation? Um, you know, I felt really anxious and just kind of overwhelmed. And once I kind of saw how things were playing out with uh, the pandemic and that, you know, online learning was the way of the immediate future, I knew that students would need supports because a lot of post-secondary institutions, universities, colleges just don't provide enough supports or they're overwhelmed with the people that need support and there's wait lists and lineups and it's hard to get appointments. So that's when I kind of came up with this idea of creating some sort of support network for students that are dealing with uh, pandemic learning. Um, I had a chance to join the Mind Your Mind um, Young Youth, sorry, Young Experts Program last, been last summer, um, which is a great organization that is based out of Ontario that does uh, youth mental health work. So they took us through the process of how to, you know, plan a project. So project planning tips, graphic design, grants, um, website design, just all the different things that you need to be successful in, you know, planning an initiative or project. Um, I got a chance to meet some, you know, great mental health advocates across the country. Um, I was the only Atlantic Canadian, which is really cool. Um, oh, so it was great. Yeah, it was great to uh, to grow, represent uh, the Maritimes. Um, so from that, it kind of grew into this quite large, um, quite large project where, you know, we have this website that has tons of resources, um, depending on your needs. So kids help phone, jack.org, um, speakbox, there's lots of different resources, depending on what you need. We try to be representative of different cultures. So there's some specific um, hotlines or help helplines for um, Indigenous um, people. Um, so we really try to, you know, ensure that we, you know, have that culture representation for those who need that help. Um, we also have a great section for volunteer opportunities for those who want to give back to their communities um, wherever they are. And then our final one is our blogs, which have really blown up over the last several months. Um, we have a great blog team that's been putting out great content on different initiatives. Um, I know we have one coming up on um, the National Reconciliation Day in a few weeks. Uh, we've had some great ones on Pride Month. Um, there's been just lots of great, great, uh, great content. Um, and coming up, we're actually going to be relaunching our network, which is super exciting, with a partnership with Speakbox. Um, they're an organization based out of Vancouver. Uh, Ethan Scott's the um, founder of the organization. Um, and we're going to be having our online network as part of their new um, program feature, which is part of, um, of their app. So initially, they were just sort of connected with um, practitioners using their website to keep track of their um, clients, um, their clients' notes about their different, um, different people that they have. Um, and then the clients could use the website and, you know, external people could use it too to find resources, resources and things like that. But this program feature will allow us to have drop in peer support sessions, um, share resources, and in the future, hopefully have some sort of chat functions so people can talk with one another. Um, so that's kind of really a really big, exciting thing we're hoping to launch sometime in October. Um, which I'm really excited about. The, the network has been the most important aspect um, that we struggled with. Um, and engaging people has been really a big struggle. You know, a lot of our post-secondary institutions haven't been as supportive of us because we're kind of an outside resource. We're not within the university. So of course there's risks with that. Um, so I'm hoping with, you know, this partnership um, that it'll help that. So I'm super excited about this partnership with them. Um, they've been super great to work with Aiden's an amazing uh, mental health advocate and, you know, mental health entrepreneur. Um, and I have to shout out Frame as well. They've been a really big supporter that have connected me with many people, um, including Aiden. Um, and if, you know, allowed me to be really successful with finding people to help with the network in terms of team members um, and connecting with other change makers. It's been, you know, they've been a really great help. So I always have to shout Frame out because they've been, they've been an amazing partner as well.
Awesome. No, Frame is an amazing, amazing organization. So that's great. And it's so amazing that you've been able to connect to so many different organizations, especially coming all the way from St. John, New Brunswick. I want to find out how have you been able, what was the methods? How were you able to um, connect with all these different organizations, especially through the pandemic, because we weren't able to meet with people? How was it for you? Yeah, so it's interesting. Most of the creation of this was actually for my cottage in Graham and Ann, New Brunswick. Big shout out to Graham and Ann. Well, no Wi-Fi, nothing. So <laughs> it was kind of interesting that the creation of this was literally from, you know, a little island in the middle of New Brunswick. So um, a lot of it was just cold emailing people, um, just saying, hey, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. And a lot of people were really receptive about it because it was a gap that was there at the time and still kind of is to be honest because like I mentioned there's still wait lists to see a counselor there's still that um, financial gap that's there for accessing uh, mental health care um, so I feel like that's a big reason why people were excited about this um, and yeah just a lot of cold emailing and then you know to gain the team that I've gained which is across the country again just posting the opportunity online and the people that I have on my team are really passionate mental health advocates um, lots of lived experience as well, which has made, um, which has made this um, organization the best that it is. So yeah, it's just been a lot of reaching out to people like, uh, like you guys too, we appreciate you guys. So yeah. that's really all it is and something I've become really good at. And I guess when I meet with people, I just, you know, try to show off the passion that I have for this. Um, and the um, dedication that I have to this. And I also try to speak about my own background and struggles with mental health. And I think, you know, that's resonated with a lot of people and has led to the success of the, of the networks thus far. No, absolutely. That is definitely one thing. Um, when, we, when I met you, the team, that was one thing. We can just definitely sense your passion. And that's exactly why I'm so excited to announce that Stacey is one of our partners over at Youth Speak. So we've been collaborating on a few projects like this podcast, and we also did an IG Live a few weeks back. So we're really excited to, um, to collaborate and see what else we can do moving forward. Because again, it's just been, we can sense your passion and see how you're ready to just grind it out and just go do all the cold calling you can to make those connections because you're so passionate about making, um, making changes for people who are dealing with mental health issues, right? So... So you mentioned about Frame and a few of the other um, organizations that you were working with, but earlier mm -hmm. on you, you mentioned about the New Brunswick Child and Youth Advocate Office. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that and your role with them? Yeah, so um, back in February, there was an unfortunate suicide of a young 16-year-old uh, girl in Fredericton, Lexi uh, Bacon, um, and this led to obviously a very public outrage at the fact that, you know, she was at the uh, Chalmers Hospital in Fredericton, um, was trying to see someone, and basically she didn't get the care she needed. You know, the hospital staff and the triage staff, they aren't equipped with the, um, with the training that they need and the expertise they need to, you know, deal with a mental health crisis. So she was sent home after they had asked her whether she could take care of herself at home, and she, of course, said yes. Um, but then six days later, she did commit suicide. So obviously, again, this led to a very big public um, out, outrage and, you know, that's understandable. So that's when the New Brunswick Child and Youth Advocates Office, um, based out of Fredericton, was contracted by the government of New Brunswick to do a review into the youth, mental health, and suicide prevention services in the province. Um, this started in March and um, ended, I would say, probably mid to late August. Um, this consisted of a couple advisory councils, um, the Stakeholders Advisory Council, which was uh, co-chaired by um, one individual, I don't remember the name, but one was Braden Nicholas. He was the former uh, Lieutenant Governor of the province, um, an amazing First Nations um, advocate and mental health advocate. Um, and I had the opportunity to co-chair the New Brunswick Youth Advisory Council with uh, Sue Duguay, um, a student at the University of Mount Den, an amazing advocate um, on her own. Um, so we got to meet with youth across the province and just get their feedback on, you know, their experience with the services of uh, the services in the province and their thoughts and the recommendations that the, um, that the advocate actually brought forward, um, the advocate currently being Norman Basse, and also an amazing, amazing man. Um, so it was a really great experience. Um, I got to meet with some uh, uh, mental health um, professionals and psychology professionals throughout the process. Um, and just getting the opportunity to be a part of the presentation on this past Wednesday in Fredericton was amazing. Um, I had the chance to um, speak to the first three recommendations. 
um, with Stu and Christian Whalen, who is a deputy um, advocate for uh, the office. Um, but it was a really amazing experience. Um, and I'm not running away from this, as we've said <laughs> the past week. Um, I'm excited to continue the process with them in making sure the government is held accountable to these recommendations, because like I mentioned, reports have happened before. There was one in 2007 called Connecting the Dots. And I'd say none of the recommendations from that report were administered at the time. Um, so I'm hoping that the government will be held accountable. Um, I'm excited to see this process move forward, implementing more of a, you know, actual permanent youth council um, for this, which is going to be a really great process. Um, some of the recommendations, um, one big one that I mentioned was um, implementing a minister for child and youth health um, that will really kind of hold the government accountable for the things that they say they're going to agree to based on these recommendations. And another one is just having that integrated services delivery model. Um, this has been talked about in the past in the province and not implemented. One great example is Access Open Minds. It's rapid service, same day service. Um, one that I've you know, been recommending to lots of people um, and you know, providing more funding for those services because they were in the province in St. John and one of the First Nation reserves, um, but the funding ended, so they're now closed. So the government has, um, the government has said that they're going to be funding these sites expanding to other parts of the province in Moncton. So fingers crossed that happens as well. But just ensuring that we have mental health services that are accessible. I think that was the third one I had talked about too. Um, and ensuring that these situations like Lexi's don't happen again. And um, yeah, it was just a really amazing process and I was super honored and proud to be part of it. Yeah, no, that's, um, it's really, it's unfortunate that something so terrible had to happen in order for um, that change to, to 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 come forth. But it's really amazing that you know that you're on the ground. You're you know you're really passionate about it, and I can see that you're not going to stop. I actually, prior to the Nova Scotia provincial election, I reached out to the former premier Ian Rankin about doing something similar in Nova Scotia because the access to mental health services in that province also is not the best. I lived there for eight years and I've tried accessing it in the past, um, and actually I tried to access it this past uh, summer or spring. And I was told I wasn't bad enough, which wow. how do they have the right to tell me that? So I think there needs to be also a review done in the province of Nova Scotia. Um, this is a call out, Premier Tim Houston. Let's get on this. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you're listening. <laughs> if you're listening, yes. Um, I'll call it to you. I think, you know, healthcare reform was such a major, major thing of his platform. So this is part of mental health or sorry, healthcare reform. So um, because there's a lot wrong in the, in the province of Nova Scotia as well. And that's, that was my second, that's been my second home for the past eight years. And I want to see uh, those supports as, as much as I want to see the supports in every province, you know, Nova Scotia also hits home for me too. So we had mentioned um, about peer to peer support and okay. some, of, some of the initiatives that you have going on in terms of that. Can you talk to me about why do you think peer to peer support is so important? Yeah. So peer to peer support, I find it's very important because, you know, those peers that are helping their own peers, they've all had that lived experience. So they're able to relate to them and empathize with them. And, you know, being able to just be on the same level as them and, you know, point them in the right direction if they need, you know, additional support. I think that's really important, but just, yeah, being able to be on their level, emphasize with what they're dealing with, because there's so many people that just, they don't understand. Um, and I've unfortunately had that situation where people don't, there's people who just haven't understood what I'm going through and they don't know what to do. So, you know, a lot of people will walk away from that and, you know, that's not fair. Um, you know, it makes them uncomfortable, but, you know, if you want to grow, you got to be made uncomfortable. So you need to be used to what these situations are. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, peer to peer, -peer support is something that's beneficial because of the fact that every, most times the, pe the peer supporter has been through what they've been through. So they're able to just be on the same level as them. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. It's very important kind of connect yeah. when you feel like somebody has gone through the same things as you, they can, they've walked the same path, they kind of had the same thoughts and they can kind of definitely more relate with what you've dealt with for sure. So I agree. Let me ask you, um, you know, I feel like the pandemic, I'm not sure if it's still upon us or if it's already passed us, but I want to ask you, what was your pandemic experience? Yeah, so it was an interesting experience. Obviously we've had one, two, three, we're in the fourth wave now which has been a very interesting fourth wave of vaccines and lots of controversy there. But the first wave, which just kind of, you know, again, went online really quick for school. 
we were all isolated in our in our homes in our apartments I was away from my family at the time I was still in Halifax and they were in New Brunswick so it was tough to be away but you know at the time Zoom and FaceTime was such a big deal and everyone was super into it at this point we're all fatigued from it <laughs> um, yeah it's been a lot so yeah. you know I felt like I was able to get a lot of work done I was able to really start these initiatives um, and once things opened up, I feel like Atlanta, Canada has been very fortunate to have probably one of the best pandemic responses around the world. Um, there's been lots of um, cohesion in terms of the provinces working together. Um, nobody's perfect. It's been back and forth. But overall, it's been really a really great res coordinated response by all four provinces down here. Um, so, you know, we were able to have our Atlantic bubble where you could travel around the Atlantic provinces um, without having to isolate, which was great for the summer. I got to spend time at my cottage and create the support network, which was great. Um, but unfortunately last, uh, you know, it was fall into winter. There was another lockdown. This was my first Christmas that I wasn't home since I had moved to Halifax. So that was really tough. Um, so it really was up and down depending on, you know, how bad the cases were, whether there was a lockdown or not. Um, you know, I was laid off several times from my job at the time, back and forth, always got rehired, but it was just such, so much uncertainty, like how long we're going to be closed this time? Um, how long can I work from home? I was lucky to have multiple income uh, streams. So, um, you know, a lot of people didn't have that luxury. So I was pretty, I was kind of one of the fortunate people. Um, but yeah, it's just been so back and forth. This fourth wave has been interesting, you know, vaccine passports are coming out, New Brunswick's actually just come out with a similar concept starting next week we have to show our proof of vaccination at any kind of recreational activities so you're going to the gym or you're going to a sporting event mm -hmm. I know that's kind of happening across mm -hmm. all the provinces so uh so that's coming up um so yeah things are looking different every day um cases right now in the maritimes are kind of going up New Brunswick's been hit with a really bad fourth wave but I feel like COVID is going to be here to stay unfortunately it'll kind of be like the influenza of 1918 where it's just going to be here forever and hopefully we can manage it and come to some sort of herd immunity seems unlikely but maybe something of that nature right so what do you think um things will look like for COVID-19 um, student support network post-pandemic yeah, so we already have talked about that. Um, we were going to actually start looking at leaning away, leaning towards more of a mental health uh, aspect rather than that COVID-19 emphasis. I feel like that's probably going to be a little bit of a delay, especially where things are so uncertain across the country and even Atlantic Canada with the case numbers rising. Because um, we'd like to really obviously hone in on the mental health aspect and be a support for the for people and be able to step away from that COVID-19 online learning aspect. Um, we're really here to stay, you know, we have lots of great resources, we can always post those volunteer opportunities, have some great blogs on relevant uh, information that's relevant to whatever time that we're in. Um, and just being able to have that network piece with Speakbox, I think that's really important, being able to connect with others, whether it's within their school community, whether it's within, you know, their subject area of interest, or just people across the country being able to talk about their own experiences, because everyone's experience has been different depending on where they are. Or were there any specific resources that you utilized during the pandemic? Yeah, so one big one I did, um, Kids Help Phone has a text service. And obviously I was going through some really rough times. So I texted them to get some support um, with a counselor and they were able to really help me through the situation I was in. Um, you know, so that was a really great resource. Um, and just, I had a chance to use um, some online counseling services, um, Hasby Counseling, which is a really great service. Um, they actually partnered with the support network and providing a discount, um, which is really cool. Um, they really kind of specialize in any mental health issue, whether it's, you know, um, PTSD, you know, anxiety, depression, um, specific to, um, you know, po um, postpartum depression. They're really specific in their focus areas. So they were a really great resource. So Hasu Counseling, um, really great resource. Um, we do have a discount, uh, a discount code for them. Um, so be sure to contact us through our website if you're interested in receiving that code. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I've had a chance to use it quite frequently. So um, they're the big two I use um, just to deal with, you know, the things that are going on. Awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I know Kids Help Phone is a resource that I've definitely used in the past. So great. And then now they have the texting service for those who are more comfortable texting. That's amazing. Yeah. But also I want to make sure we give um, anyone who's listening 
your website to go to. So it's www. So it's COVID-19 mentalhealthawareness.com. Awesome. Okay, great. So for anybody who's looking for resources or how you can connect to some more resources, if you're looking for volunteer opportunities, or even if you're looking at to check out some of the great blogs that she has on um, the website, definitely go ahead and get connected. Okay. Awesome. So it's been such a great um, conversation. I've learned really a lot about all the different organizations that you've been a part of and learned so much why you're so passionate and got to really, really feel your passion through all the things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So earlier in the conversation, I asked you um, if you could choose a color to describe your mood, what color would that be and why? I want to ask you now, has that mood or color changed? Yeah, I feel like it's more red. And I feel like it's because, you know, I guess I'm just excited about what the future holds and the passion and all that. So I feel like I'm just excited to, you know, see what happens in the realm of mental health, whether it's in this province, whether it's in Atlantic Canada or across the country, or even around the world, because I feel like there's so many people who are, you know, really, really passionate and want to advocate for mental health to be changed and to be, you know, better supported. Awesome. Okay, so Stacy. Just before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you if you could go back in time and give yourself um, one resource, one message, what would that resource or message be? Well, I think it would be just to, you know, never give up. Um, I feel like that's something that I've wanted to do so many times because of my struggles, but um, it will get better. I still have to tell myself that, myself that every day, but, you know, and that I am good enough, you know. This past week has really allowed me to take a look at what I've been doing, um, you know, having a chance to chat with some mental health people and the whole presentation and being part of that, uh, you know, presentation of the review on Wednesday. I feel like that really made me believe that I'm good enough and what I'm doing is making change, changes to the mental health, uh, the mental health uh, sphere. So, yeah, this week was just really inspiring. And I guess that's kind of made me really take a look at what I'm doing. I'm like, wow. I'm kind of, you know, doing some really cool stuff. So, and it's making a difference, which is really cool. So yeah, just not giving up, you know, you are good enough and, you know, you're making a difference and you can make a difference too. So, because when I was younger, I wasn't doing things like this. You know, I was just kind of shy into myself. I've become a lot more extroverted over the years, just, you know, starting off in university, being really heavily involved and leading some societies. And now we're, you know, presenting a mental health report for the province like I've cut it's, it's just come such a long way with all these different uh different experiences that I've done over the years so yeah absolutely and very beautifully said thank you so much Stacy, for joining us on the speak real podcast it's been an amazing conversation I loved hearing all about your the different organizations that you chair and all the different hats that you wear. It was awesome and interesting that you opened up a little bit about your depression and anxiety as well. Um, I loved, enjoyed the part about peer-to-peer -peer support and why it's so important, as well as talking about post-pandemic and what that would look like for COVID-19 student support network. So it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Stacey. Yeah, thank you so much. It was my pleasure and, you know, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you want to hear more stories, don't forget to subscribe, comment, and like. To support more youth by youth-led projects, visit us at youthspeak.ca, where you can donate and spread youth mental health awareness. Youth Speak Performance Charity. Speak. Inspire. Change.